to introduce him uh, craig has graduated from united states of uh, united states merchant marine academy with a degree in maritime transportation he founded and leads the quality assurance team at lucid software so the topic for uh, for, for craig today would be taking charge of testing seems to be a really interesting one and if you want to know more about craig and also see his video interviews we you we do have a, a, a and you are uh, at the agile gtr website so welcome aboard craig uh, over to you you can please feel free to start sharing your screen greetings and hello everyone so let me get started on the, this concept of taking charge of testing so I, i think honestly some of the talks we had earlier uh kind of speak to this as well um and i think that's probably highlighting the fact that this is it's an important thing for us as testers to take into consideration in our careers and in the places that we work uh as mentioned i i graduated uh from the merchant marine academy which means that i learned how to drive ships for a living uh that's definitely not testing software uh but i did get to learn how to use the sextant to figure out where i am on earth that's kind of cool it's also very time consuming um i've been doing qa for over 20 years now and um At Lucid Software, we have a team of 35 testers. 30 of those are manual testers. Five of those are automation engineers. We release two times per day for all of the backend microservices, and then we have one release per week uh, for our entire front-end UI that goes out at the same time, uh, and that requires a single one-day regression by uh, half of our manual testers, roughly, not quite half. Just some context for. what it is that we're currently doing uh at Lucid. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um and and it's kind of a a setup for what the rest of this is all about. Um some years ago, I took a job uh doing QA for a 3D modeling and animation company. Um and I'd been doing it for maybe 8 months or so when my uh boss at the time came in and told me like, "Hey, uh FYI, Um, my boss was a developer the lead developer of the product i was working on and he comes in and he says hey the the office sorry i lived in california and i was working remotely for a company in utah where i currently live um and so he said listen uh, the people in utah would like to have a a manager for you that is in utah uh in order to uh you know have updates and be part of their morning standups um so i said oh okay and i was given this new boss um my first one on one with this boss they asked me one question pretty much really emphatically how many test cases have you written for our 3d modeling and animation software and to be honest this question struck me quite uh I, i was very confused i didn't understand why i was being asked this question to me it was ridiculous uh i laughed at the question and i more or less ignored it and then moved on and discussed other things um this happened again in another follow up one on one a week later uh where again i was asked how many test cases have you written and again i laughed and said like none that that's that's pointless right now um i was the only tester on the product so it's not like i was documenting the process for anyone else at the time and uh it's a 3d modeling application the 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 number of test cases are basically infinite so long story short uh i got called into my boss's office uh well virtually of course and um I was being put on, you know, report for insubordination. Um basically since I had refused to answer the question and I had refused to do anything about the number of test cases written, I was being written up to say like if you don't actually start doing what your boss tells you to do, we are going to have to fire you. Um that was that was quite a surprise to me. Um and I was told that I would I would have to spend half of my day from then on writing test cases and documenting the test cases for our 3D modeling software. I didn't think that was a particularly great use of my time, but uh, you know, getting late getting fired was a really terrible thing, so I started doing it. 
uh, it didn't last a week before the lead developer came into my office and said, Craig, can you come look at this with me real quick? And I said, I, you know, I would love to, but I really can't. And it, it really caught him off guard and he did a double take and looked at me and said, what do you mean you can't come look at this? I was like, well, and then I explained, well, I have to write these test cases. Uh, he was French. I'm pretty sure he was cussing in French. I don't really know. I don't speak French, but uh, it was loud and not very play happy. And about an hour later, I got a phone call from some completely different person in the company in Utah telling me that um, basically to pretend like the whole thing had never happened, uh, that person that had become my boss was no longer my boss and they wanted me to just go back to managing myself as I had been doing and to forget about the letter of reprimand and inspired nation and that they were going to shred that and, and it never happened. So that's all well and good. And we'll kind of jump into uh, deconstructing that entire series of events. But there's one really, really important piece of context that I did not have throughout the entirety of that situation. And that was that my new boss, their previous profession had been working on technical documentation and writing test cases for the space shuttle program. So, you know, it's a bit, bit of an important piece of context for me to have not understood about the person that was managing me. And, um, and it kind of made me think, you know, to these days, as I look back on my career and some mistakes that I've made and how I could grow from them, uh, this is a really good example of a time where, whew, I did not handle that super well. So let's, let's dig into it. Um, part of taking control of testing or taking charge of your testing is you have to start by being willing to question yourself and question what you are doing in, in order to accomplish your testing. So from my story, I basically laughed at my boss's demand for me to write test cases. Um, but realistically, in hindsight, I realized I should have actually questioned my own skills, my own communication skills or soft skills, as some will say. You know, was it really the best response for me to, to just laugh it off? Um, did, did it allow me to get them to see my way of thinking? No, I I. I didn't understand their context. I didn't have any clue why they they were asking me this. Um, and as a result, I certainly didn't build any bridges that made my life or job easier. So let's let's talk about questioning what you do on a day-to-day -day basis as a tester. And, and I certainly do not mean in an imposter syndrome kind of way, that feeling of I'm I'm making this up. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm I'm going to get caught. Figure people are going to realize I yeah. What look? We, most of us come from non like we we didn't go to college for this. We didn't get a degree for this or university. We we just many of us fell into testing, um, and as such we we don't have professional training in it. We do that on the job, but that's okay. Don't don't let that. Don't let that ruin or guide or control your perception of how you do what you do. Um, and definitely don't feed into it by questioning, do I even know what I'm doing? There is a degree of creativity and curiosity necessary to be a good tester. And because of that, uh, a lot of what you do is going to be a bit of learning on the job. So what I really mean is perform constant personal retrospectives. You need to be honest about uh, what you're doing and you need to be critical about it. Like, is it the best approach? Is there any other way that you could test a piece of software that would be more effective, that would reveal more bugs, that would help you mitigate the risk of it being released? Um, is there a new tool that's come out, you know, either in the last month, the last year? Is there a tool you've looked at in the past and it didn't fit, but now it might? Um, don't, you know, don't keep don't turn a blind eye to new opportunities for testing. Is there perhaps some form of heuristic that you could use to help you generate new test case ideas? Um, or is there somebody else either on your team internally or even externally? Is there someone you could go and you say, hey, how would you test this? Remember also that the more you test something, the more your brain starts to 
have a bias against seeing what's really going on. Your brain starts to edit sort of in a way the things that you're seeing as you're doing your testing. And because of that, you can start to miss things. So remember that brain bias can be the en enemy. And then by approaching testing of something in a variety of different ways, you can try to mitigate the risk of developing brain bias from coming at testing something the same way over and over and over. So keep yourself on your toes and question your own approaches so you can find ways to not fall prey to brain bias. Next up is question your process. So again, from my story, I instinctively rejected the idea of writing test cases for the software that I was testing, mostly because it was it seemed like a completely insurmountable task um, to, to get through all of the tests. Um, you know, when you're talking about adding 3D objects to a scene and trying to keep create some kind of 3D scene, this is a creative application. There's there's an infinite combination of things that a user could want to put in the scene, an infinite combination of you know, just points, vertices, the, the way they orient them, how many there are, how they're connected, and so on and so forth. So writing a test case really didn't, it just didn't seem like the best use of my time. But that said, I still should have questioned my own process for testing was there some level of test documentation that would have made sense for me to do? Probably. I mean, if nothing else, documenting at a high level or what I like to call testing prompts, just reminders of the things that I know I need to test, the functionality that's there that users are going to want to interact with, making sure that I don't forget those things. And, and testing prompts includes things like, Sometimes you've got a feature where there's a there's a gotcha, there's a some bug that, that happened at one point in the past and it was really bad and you don't ever want it to happen again. Um, for me at Lucid, that scarring moment is uh, server rack diagrams and lines. When we released server rack diagrams for the first time in Lucid chart, if you drew a single line across a server rack, it just completely crashed the product. Uh, and that was that was a really unexpected interaction because w if you were making a server graph image, it was a very custom set of shapes. Why would you need a line? And I just didn't even think about, well, they could be using the server rack in part of another type of diagram. So embarrassing moment, but I, I learned from it and never, ever again allowed that to break. So testing prompts can help you remember things, but since they're not detailed test cases with step-by-step -step how to test something, it requires you to use your creativity as a tester and your curiosity as a tester to think of and approach testing something and from a different perspective, more or less every time you come to it. And that can help you again with the brain bias. Um, so I don't know that Based on my story, I don't know that there was really another way for me to accomplish the testing that I was doing. I was one person testing the product by myself. Uh, that's redundant, sorry. Um, and and it is a super creative uh, piece of software. So writing extensive test case wasn't really an option. Automation was not really an option. And it's not like I could use some sort of... Um, automation that would click on the screen because the developers had decided to create their own completely from scratch windowing and UI engine for Windows instead of just using Windows. So there didn't seem to be another way to do it. But still, remember that when you're working on a team, you have an entire team. Uh, you can work with them to figure out better ways to test and you should verify on a regular basis, is this the best way for us to be doing the testing that we're doing? Is there is there any other way we could do it that was more efficient? Um, one of the companies that I worked at um, had a couple of testers doing uh, testing on a variety of applications, three different applications, and basically we were kept apart. We, we were never encouraged to communicate. 
except for our Friday lunches where we would go, you know, to lunch together. But beyond that, we never worked with each other on testing each other's products. And that seems like a real waste in hindsight. Uh, make sure that your, your team's goals are appropriate and prioritized. Uh, are you aware of any impending deadlines? Uh, are you aware of the criticality of certain functionalities and the products that you're releasing? Uh, make sure that you understand how to efficiently use your time to get the best value out of what you do for the user. And honestly, ask yourself, should, should we really be writing test cases? Because sometimes the answer is yes. You might work in an industry where having clearly documented test cases uh, is, is an absolute necessity, particularly if people's lives are at stake. Um, you might have regulation requiring you to write those test cases. And in those cases, absolutely, be sure to write your test cases, be thorough, right? But there will be industries where the answer is no, you, you don't need to go to, this, to the extent of writing a full-blown test case with preconditions and, and set up and tear down and individual you know, test steps with expected results. Don't do it if you don't need to, because remember, you've also got to maintain that documentation and that can be a huge time sink if you don't really need it. So if you can use testing prompts, give it a try. Uh, it's a great way to make sure that you remember the things that are important. And it's a great way to make sure that when other people jump into test stuff, they're not, they're not just looking at a checklist of things to do. Checklists kill all creativity. Um, and once you're doing a checklist, you're no longer really testing. All right, finally, and perhaps for some maybe uh, most terrifyingly, uh, we get to the question of question your boss. I don't know about the, the rest of you, but honestly, uh, in my profession as a tester, I have had very few instances. Well, okay. Honestly, basically no instances of my boss has actually been a tester themselves. I've never been managed by somebody who was a software tester of any kind previously. And because of that, I'm painfully aware of the fact that my boss probably doesn't know exactly what it is that I do. And so again, from my story, you know, I felt that my boss was wrong about test plans, but it instead would have been better for me to have asked why they wanted me to write the test plans, why it was that they thought it was so important for me to write such detailed test plans. Because if I had engaged in a conversation with them about that, I would have understand, I would have had a better understanding of why it was important to them. I would have understood that their previous experience was one in which test cases were mandatory and, and valuable. And I could have explained why it wasn't as valuable in our particular use case. It's a big question of whether or not they've ever been a tester before. Um, and if they haven't been, then they, they just very probably don't understand what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, earlier we discussed a lot, you know, what's the difference between a manual tester? What's the difference between that and an automation tester? And then for us at Lucid, we also have something else we call uh, test ops. And those are the people that work with the DevOps team. They test all the backend portions of the product. They work with the CICD pipeline and they help manage all of our uh, testing environments. So understanding the difference between all those teams is not something that I expect my boss, who's the VP of engineering, necessarily to have a super clear and detailed understanding of, but I need to make sure as their test manager that I'm communicating to him what these people all do and what the value is that they provide. Automation engineers provide tremendous value in making so sure that a manual tester doesn't have to spend their time extensively regressing the product prior to every release. This is, this is an invaluable tool for us to get through our regression in a timely fashion. What once used to take me five days by myself is now done in 
a day uh, by, you know, something like 12 people. And this allows us to release at the pace of once per week. Um, so the other thing to consider is, you know, your boss um, will often want to feel like they're providing you direction. They're providing you, you know, information that is relevant to what you do. They want to feel like they know what they're talking about. But if they're not a tester, oftentimes they're they're relying upon past experience and exposure to other testing teams. And sometimes they'll be relying on just things that they've read. So as we know, context is very important in QA. And in order for us to, to have an effective team and question our process, we need to make sure that what we're doing makes sense for the thing that we're testing. So just because your boss tells you, I want you to test in this manner, you should say, well, okay, I'll think about it. But let me just make sure if that's the right thing to do or not, because it might not be the right thing. Sometimes the context is different. When I started it uh, at another company, when I uh, was new to the testing there, uh, they, they wanted me to write automation from the get-go. And I said, I don't really think that that's the best use of my time. I'm the only tester right now. Um, we're trying to release this every other week. It takes me a full week to run the regression by myself. Uh, there is virtually no automation at this point. So I understand why you'd like to have some, but I don't think that I don't think that I have time to write that automation. But my boss insisted. And so that it was a moment where I had to agree and and commit and figure out how do I show my boss this is not the right time to do it. Sometimes you need to perform a manual regression for a period of time in order for you to understand what is it about this regression that takes a long time for, for a tester to get through. Once you understand what those slow test cases are, then you can set your automation people on them and you can really start to narrow those things down. And that's where you can start to save time on the regression. And that's where automation can be a tremendous help. After a period of time, um, you know, trying to write automation, working on it, trying to add some things, uh, we started to recognize that, oh, look, the, you know, the bug count is, is getting larger and larger. Why is this happening? Well, it's because I'm spending my time writing automation and not actually testing the product. So just because you know, automation can be super helpful, but make sure that you take into consideration, is this the right time to do it? Because there is a lot of maintenance that has to be done. Are you gonna be changing the front end UI? Then maybe it's not the best time to be writing extensive end-to-end uh, -end tests that will rely on the UI. And, you know, obviously we deal with buzzwords just like any other industry right now. AI is a big buzzword. There are some things that it can do, but there are definitely one thing that it cannot do, and that's test anything like a human could. It will test what we teach it to test, but that still requires a human in, in some degree to help train it. Um, but what it can never do is see something out of the corner of its eye and go, huh, that was weird. Let me dig into that some more. So uh, don't get too hung up on worrying about um, oh, you know, is this newfangled testing uh, thing going to take over my job? Anytime you have a user interface that a human being can interface with and, and click on and then try to enter data into, you're always going to need a person to sit down and go through that workflow and, and kind of give the feedback of, is this intuitive? AI and automation can't answer that question. They can help with things perhaps like, uh, are these colors um, you know, falling into the range that we don't want to use? Uh, maybe is this, uh, is this button out of the our branding colors, right? You can train an AI to recognize things like that, I suppose. But you know, a lot of designers and product people these days will talk about, does your product delight the user? And uh, I'm, 
I don't know how to write automation that answers that question. You need a tester that can sit down, use the product, try to solve a problem in the product using the features themselves as a real user would. And so that's why it's critically important uh, for testers to pursue creative activities with your product, uh, depending on the nature of the product. Um, you know, although something like Lucidchart, which is predominantly about diagramming and flow charting um, or representing your AWS infrastructure, um, it's also something that you can be very creative with. And as a result, we, we try to encourage creativity as much as we can on the team. So kind of a, a, some final thoughts on taking charge of testing. You should always keep in mind that you wanna do the kind of testing that your users will be happy to know they're essentially paying you to do. Um, you don't wanna be testing something just because they thought it was important. You, you, you need to verify. Uh, obviously, we always talk about trust, but verify in testing. Remember that you, it's an odd duck of a job. It's a strange thing. Our, 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 you know, our jobs are dependent upon other people making mistakes. And it's up to us to find ways to tactfully and politely explain, hey, this didn't work quite the way we thought. This gets back to what Marette was talking about earlier, like answering those questions about what is it that we're trying to build? What solution are we trying to provide the user for a particular test uh, or use case scenario? And can they actually do it with the thing that we are building? Um, and then remember too that managers and certainly you know people at the director level and above often do think about things in terms of metrics. Uh, it's not my favorite word. I, as a tester, I, I really dislike um, metrics in the context of what is a tester doing on their day-to-day -day basis. Um, I don't find a lot of metrics valuable in, in that sense, but like, I do want to know how many bugs have we had that escaped to production with the last set of releases. Um, and I want to make sure that 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 trend line is not heading up because that would be worrisome. Um, I really feel like it's important for testers to never report on a meaningless metric. Somebody's gonna ask you to do it or they already have. And I think it's valuable to push back, find a way to report on something that actually will be meaningful for the users rather than just for the person that requested the metric. Try to educate them on why it's actually not going to be a good metric um, because you, you need to get them on your side. And, and as testers, and I think this largely came up as people were discussing, you know, should we remove manual from manual testing? Um, and I think, you know, the, the answer there is that what we do as testers is, is creative and it's skilled. And, the, and as managers in testing and as testers, we need to educate the people that we work with that the value we provide is that verification that the thing we built will solve a problem for the user that they will want to pay for. Our value is not in going through a rote checklist in a series of test cases and just doing something that you know we might be able to get an AI to do or or even automation to do. A tester's value comes in the idea of the shift left concept. Testing as early and often as possible. Getting involved while a feature is being defined. Uh, working with the product owners to understand what it is that they want to solve so that the tester can start thinking about what would that look like. When a, when a UX team generates mocks for that new feature, a tester can look at it and mentally use their knowledge and experience of the product and go through and kind of imagine how would it feel to use this and any obvious or glaring issues will crop up and they can speak about it. And testers can stop bugs from ever being written 
by calling attention to potential conflicts of usability during the design process. All right, that's what I've got for you today. Uh, I wanna encourage everybody to, to try to work with your teams, work with your, your QA teams, work with your dev teams, work with product, talk to everybody, share what it is that testers do and help them understand where your value really is. And I wanna thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Really appreciate this. And obviously, if you have any questions, I'm I'm happy to answer them. Yes. Uh, hey, thank you very much, Craig. It was really insightful about your story. And uh, it was really interesting to know how did you manage to take care of your boss? OK, so I think we do have a couple of questions. One is uh, any alternative documentation for uh, writing test cases from your perspective? Uh, so. Uh, we used test rail for a little while, um, but that was that was definitely a lot more than we needed. Um, currently, we're using a product called Rike, W-R-I-K-E. Uh, this is more of a task management product, but uh, it has actually been more than sufficient to cover uh, tracking the test prompts that we use. Um, and I suppose if you... If you like spreadsheets, that's always a, a perfectly acceptable option. It's it's not, you know, it can be it can be a little bit of extra work to get it set up to rerun another test run, but it if you don't have too many test cases, it can do in a pinch. Okay, okay, thanks for that. One more we do have uh, from Deepti. Can test prompts be broadly called as scenarios? Would it help to decide the coverage? Um, I generally think that scenarios are probably a little bit or e even higher level. Um, but it is, a, it is similar to be honest. Okay. Um, okay, and I, I guess in terms of deciding the coverage, um, yeah, definitely testing prompts are part of what we use to help make sure that we have coverage. So anytime there's a new feature being developed, uh, we're gonna write a testing prompt for that feature so that at the end of the sprint, we can have a conversation uh, with the developers uh, about is this feature, uh, this testing prompt, do you know if it's covered by any kind of automation or do we need to make sure that we include this in the manual regression? So. Uh, those can be helpful for that. Okay. Okay. So thanks for that. Uh, I think we we have one more question from Mayur. Uh, how to make a checkpoint to ensure our test automation framework is robust? Um, so the the thing. So from my perspective. Test automation's job is, for Lucid at least, is to support what the manual testers need to do. Um, so we know that our automation framework is robust uh, if tests UI end-to-end -end tests can be written by developers themselves uh, rather than a test engineer, uh, automation engineer. So we want the framework to empower the engineers to just write the tests themselves. Uh, the automation engineers should be helping maintain the reliability of the tests so that they execute, you know, without without false positives, um, and then helping to grow that framework. Um, and then both of those things are meant to help make sure that the tester doesn't have to spend as much time doing the regression manually before release and can instead spend their time, you know, going to meetings, talking to uh, the team about the, the plans they have for what's going to be developed and thinking through what are the risks and how can they mitigate those as early as possible. And then also, of course, just going through testing people's pull requests as they come in, uh, integrating with the other parts of the system um, and then collaborating with other members of the team to help them test. We do a lot of pair testing. We do a lot of mob testing. Um, so I think 
knowing that the automation framework is robust largely comes from can developers write tests effectively without needing to ask a ton of questions? Um, and is there some portion of the regression that takes a lot of time for manual testers, but we can't yet write automation for it? Then in that case, we would be lacking in the robustness. Okay, I see. I hope that answers my your question. Okay. So uh, thanks for answering them. Um, thank you very much, Craig, for uh, coming here and, and sharing your story. Uh